good morning to you all colleagues for this um good morning important um, webinar series and i would like to first of all thank the library for this wonderful job they have brought to our mess as the eighth webinar series i'm also grateful to Approval Chancellor for accepting to deliver this lecture. I'll be going through the program as given to me by the by the organizers. And first, the theme is academic freedom versus partisanship, the art of making judgment. Professor Amevi Akakovi. Our provision staff is going to deliver it, and I will be grateful to invite him to proceed for the delivery on the topic as proposed by the organizers of the webinar series. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zubero, and uh, I welcome the audience all colleague lecturers deans to this presentation let me share my screen and then let's start um discussion is my screen visible is my screen visible can somebody confirm whether you could see my screen i can yeah, see your screen can see. yes it's check. so as uh, presented by the, the moderator. Today's topic is on academic freedom versus partisanship, the art of making judgment. I think uh, just recently we had a very similar one and then we came with the term academic witchcraft and that actually elicited a lot of debate and discussion and then we've been talking about um, what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. I see this as a second version of this previous one. It built upon some of the same concept. And I think uh, in the end of it, all, we'll have a lot to discuss and to share among ourselves. I particularly want to thank the head of department, deans, and then academic uh, lecturers who are present here. This message is mostly for us to also the administrative staff in the higher ranks. This message is mostly for us to debate and appreciate what goes in decision-making in universities. And I believe that in the end, we shall have a, a good discussion. So in the presentation today, we'll talk briefly about introduction, a bit about the academic freedom itself, and then partisanship and its impact on academic environment. And we'll talk of the art of making judgment. And finally, a conclusion. Let's begin with the first slide on the introduction. Look at a gentleman. I named him Pangloss. Pangloss uh, in, a, in a very doubtful situation. How to choose and how to choose. In actual fact, I begin by saying that leadership is fundamental to progress and success. And Dr. Maxwell, with his repeated quote, says that everything rises and falls on leadership. What is leadership? Generally, leadership is a set of decisions made when faced with constraints. In our life, every day we make decisions, either to go to work, to use the car, to use this road. Somebody says that it's like a set of box in front of us where we have to choose most of the time between two things. Either you go right or left, up or down, or you decide to do or not do. And it is the same game that made leadership. Leaders, leaders are faced with a number of constraints and at all times they need to make a decision that actually move their, 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 their university or their settlement forward or backward. We in engineering sometimes, we see it as an optimization problem where good leadership is about finding always the optimal solution to a set of problems, knowing the constraints and the resources available because all problems don't have the same solution in the same you know, context, in different contexts. The context tells you the resources available to you and the constraints you are facing. But in all situations, there is always a best decision to make. And in actual fact, it's sometimes difficult to appreciate 
a best decision at a go. But really, you appreciate that with the output. That's why we say that to summarize, leadership rises on decision making as a tool, and good leadership is simply measurable by output. What has happened in the end that tells whether that decision you took was a good one or a bad one. So, good decision making comes from sound judgment. Sound judgment, which itself, which itself relies on leaders' education and style of life among several factors. That's a very strong and heavy statement. Sometimes when we are confronted with situation, what actually motivates the, the type of decision we take? Yes, a lot of factors are to be taken into consideration, but there is this factor that depends on the person's education, how the person was brought up, the, the knowledge and the skills the person acquired, and how the person behaved in smaller situations. This actually determines how the person also behaves in a bigger situation. So, so to say, we want to dive into that side today and learn exactly how we could improve decision-making based on style of life, based on a concept that sometimes are unconscious to ourselves, yet again, influence most of the decisions we make. When a wrong decision is making is the reason why actually 90% of leaders fail today. Failure is because they, they, they face situation and they do not take the best decision and it keeps reoccurring and reoccurring and at the point it, it turned down to a complete failure. And therefore they attempt to create robot and artificial intelligence to implement human intelligence and make good decisions all times. Because you see, somebody may ask, why is it that the robot and the artificial intelligence will make a better decision than human? Is it not the same human that programmed the intelligence in them? Yes, I side with you. But sometimes when you are able to develop the optimal solution to a set of problem and you are able to educate a robot to behave the same way, then anytime the robot, the robot face such a situation, it end up taking the best decision. The humans, there is this variation. Today, he can do it well. Tomorrow, because of other sentiment and other feelings that you cannot understand, it does it different way. And in the end, the robot tend to be more effective. So today, people are looking at automating the world, controlling the world by using one or the other of this means. So discoveries in artificial intelligence robotics are just on the ascendancy, especially in countries like Russia, China, Japan, and USA. And People are always faced like in this drawing on my right side, what decision to make. The people want to rely mostly on this artificial tool to make decisions these days. So, and I'm saying today, the day is coming where robots will lead company instead of humans. Because it, it is very clear that humans have failed in leadership to a very, very high extent. And therefore, there is a way, you know, to take over. And this failure from human side can only be attributed to failure in making good decisions. So therefore, the reason why we must look at this presentation. Today, look at what's happening. A robot can educate people on how to work. There is a robot electrician. This, this gentleman can fix your electrical socket. So perhaps if he's trained to do this, you always do it best. And uh, an electrician who sometimes might be doing it and pick a phone call and forget to connect one wire, that will end up causing a trouble for you. Or maybe a ro imagine the robot caterer. This is the robot that can cook for you. So you just need to teach the, the robot, for instance, how to cook your MPC. And then once you provide the gadget, you click and then your MPC is there, cook the same taste. So these are the, the changes that are happening and many, many type of them. And soon to come, the robot leader who can lead a company, who can always take optimal you know, solutions to solve problems. And therefore, it calls upon us to do better in our way of behaving. This will lead me, therefore, to the main topics of today, which is academic freedom. The term academic freedom is a very controversial term. If you read or you search in the literature, there have been several different definitions to the term. And uh, people drag it one way or the other, but I brought a few one, and I want to zoom into a particular one. 
in some circumstances, people define it as institutional academic freedom. That is, it refers to the right of a university to determine its educational mission, free from governmental intervention. So universities must be autonomous. They must be able to make their own decision because they are perceived as a place where brains are being mined and therefore they need that autonomy. Secondly, academic freedom also refers to the right of an individual professor to teach his or her curriculum without undue interference from university officials. So we don't teach to please or to, to just uh, adjust the knowledge to please the circumstances we are, but we teach the reality as it is. We tell the truth as it's supposed to be. Then, the third one which interests me the most is that in an extended definition, academic freedom refers to the ability of an individual to make some judgment based on a systematic procedure. You see, we need to re-emphasize systematic procedure because you see, in the absence of systematic procedure, people jump quickly the process of judgment and, and they run into conclusion by looking at one or two factors. There must be an established systematic procedure in one person to make some judgment which are devoid from, of, of any influence or interferences but based on facts and based on reasons. This is the definition that will lead our discussion today. Then I take, for instance, an example. Remember how the VC of the University of Ghana, Professor NSIT, he banned the public transport on campus and then regulated it. There were controversy. It can be done, this, that, it's been done. And that brought sanity today. When you go to University of Ghana, you don't see trotro and taxis anyhow. But even if you see a few of them, they are regulated. And that has solved a lot of problems. Sometimes it's tough, but it must be a very good decision founded on fact, and then you push forward. I take this definition, this quote from Albert Einstein. He says that, by academic freedom, I understand the right to search for truths and to publish and teach what one holds to be true. So there is an element of truth there, and the right also implies a duty. That is, one must not conceal, you must not conceal any part of what one has recognized to be true. This is, this is actually summarizing it all. So many investors change their mode of delivery amidst the COVID-19. Tough decision in most cases. Yet again, these are some of the fruits of good academic freedom. Now, what are some of the benefits of academic freedom? Academic freedom, when is well exercised in the community, especially in the university setup, it brings up fairness, equity, and transparency in leadership. Because people believe decisions are not made based on other factors that are baseless, but on fact, and that the decisions that are made are actually supposed to help the, the university. For instance, Academic freedom helped to build trust and confidence. I, I wouldn't mention the name of the university. I visited one of the universities where you'll be surprised that the university community uh, came together with the vice chancellor and agreed that they will, they will sacrifice some of their dues to just um, put together um, some, some fund and build a university uh, structure that will bear the name of everybody. And actually, that, that has actually happened. And this building is there. And when you go there, everybody tell you, I sacrificed my allowance for two years to get this building. Today, it's very difficult to do that. Not because the good intention is not there, but because sometimes there is this lack of academic freedom, which does not help to build trust and confidence. The academic freedom, when it's there, you know that the person proposing to you let's just do this and that, is doing it in the better interest of all of us because he is factual, is very um, effective in his way of making decisions. So that is the benefit that academic freedom brings in an academic setup. Academic freedom reduces the risk of taking wrong decisions because when academic freedom is not exercised, decisions are based on wrong element and the wrong element can be hearsay, they can be abrupt decisions made on no fact, and sometimes just to favor somebody or the other, and then it leads to wrong decisions. And sometimes wrong decisions can take people far. Academic freedom brings about new knowledge and innovation. Sometimes when a problem is posed 
and then this freedom is exercised, then you see that people bring things that you have no touch of. And yet again, some of them are very innovative and can lead the university far. Academic freedom also encourages diplomacy. Diplomacy is very expensive. Sometimes it comes with a cost, but it encourages a lot of diplomacy so that you should listen to people's view and then take the best out of them. Academic freedom is necessary for progress and also for continuous progress. It's a spirit that encourages progress, and I will emphasize on that towards the end of this presentation. Again, what are some of the challenges faced by academic freedom? Academic freedom not well communicated is often misunderstood to routing because people think people should not take the exercise of academic freedom to something that looks like unionism or syndicalism. You see, it is not a fight, but it's a way of, of, express, of expressing what one perceives as being true in a very, uh, you know, a friendly, amicable manner. So sometimes if not well communicated or if communicated with too much energy, it tends to be an opposition and that can cause a lot of conflict. Expressing a view contrary to your superior and doing so in a harsh manner, they will not appreciate the academic freedom you are exercising, but it will tend to be a, a form of revolt. Expressing opinion in leadership position too can also be challenging in that same manner. Academic freedom in Africa, and I need to talk about our context, is often challenged with cultural belief because people make decisions mainly based on the culture they are coming from. Ah, this is not how we do it. We should do it like this. Social needs, economic challenges, part partisanship, and which becomes, again, my next uh, point of debate. Why partisanship at this moment? Partisanship is the quality or state of being a partisan. Strong and sometimes blind adherence to a particular party to a faction, a faction, a group of people, you know, who come about a certain concept and they are going by a faction, cause or a person. So let's not let's differentiate this from the, the political understanding. We are not talking of politics yet. Partisanship is a broader word. So it defines that state of mind of supporting a group of ideas or supporting a cause or a person based on reason well known to the person. But the support of a person or a group, a party or cause especially when seen as biased or emotional. That is, that is where it becomes very interesting here. So sometimes it is obvious that this support that is given is not on the basis of any factual or any effective reasoning, but is rather on the basis of some pure biases. That is what makes it the word partisanship. Again, the quality or action of strongly supporting a person, principle, or political party, so to say, often without considering or judging the matter very carefully. When we fail to judge or to actually carefully consider the matter and make judgment, then we have, we have surrendered our own effective mind, our capability of thinking to support somebody, an ideology, a group of people or something. And that is called partisanship. Now, why this debate? Because partisanship often distinguish, you know, uh, partisanship in, in academic setups brings a lot of um, conflict, you know, as far as progress of universities are concerned. And I will justify this from the literature again. Often, these guys under the name loyalty, some individual perpetrate evils. These are called evils, slandering, reporting, often to gain undue or merited advantages from superiors. So when you do that, you mislead the people in their process of making judgment, you see, because they swallow what is wrong, even at the, at the back door, and therefore that matters in the decision making than what is factual. So they belong to what we described in our previous presentation as the academic witches and wizards. This is on the lower side. Partisanship are formed today in universities based on political belonging. Yes, there is this request which, which has a lot of policies and supported documentation that people make. That, uh, I mean, thoroughly must be ascertained with the, on the basis of the policies available. But we put aside the, 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 the policy and we say, you, you are coming from my hometown. We are from the same tribe. So therefore, let's make sure he gets it. And you, you will not get it. 
because you are not part of the tribes. This is what partisanship will lead to. When, when people, when we put ourselves in that corner, this is what it leads to. Cultural background, unmeasured ambition to join committees and gain positions can lead people to do a lot of wrong things. And money, money as the bottom line. So we need to be careful. Partisanship affects academic freedom adversely and therefore destabilizes the right decision-making approach. When partisanship takes place, instead of academic freedom, then you see that a lot of decisions taken are wrong. A lot of decisions. It, it appears obvious for, for people who have practiced the spirit of academic freedom for some extent, to some extent, it becomes very obvious and glaring when that spirit perhaps is not actually being exercised in the setup. And therefore, we want to call Awaken Ourselves today to see how we can improve our academic freedom abilities. So, while partisanship may have positive impact in politics, often leading to vote winning, so partisanship is a very good thing for politics. If you want to win vote, you need people to support you, and you must find a way to get them to rally behind you. It may have dire and then severe consequences, on the other hand, to many establishments, especially the academic institutions, because in the academic institution, the nature and the, the type of business that is being carried is such that, I mean, this is not the right the right thing for progress. The right thing is rather the academic freedom. Universities are sustained by positive thinking, judgment, and right decision-making approaches. And I'm saying this is not just for me. I'm going to give you a few literatures that support this in the end of this presentation. And number three, this is the reason why when confronted with top challenges, government and other agencies actually refer matters to university for absolutely fair and dissenting mind, devoid of emotion. Because there is a belief, there is a trust that the investing mind brings, and therefore they don't make decisions based on emotion and other factors that prevail in other sectors of the, you know, the economy. But now, if you now resort to also conduct ourselves as maybe in politics and other you know, key areas, then we we'll lose that privilege, we we'll lose that, that pride, that prestige, of being an institution that carry our mind forward. Partisanship reduces the spirit of constructive academic criticism. It reduces it because decisions are quick made based on favoritism and other factors. And therefore, it can lead to the acceptance of wrong or erroneous you know, policies easily. In university management, is mostly policy. Let's do it like this. Let's don't do it like that. But how to take a decision is based on many facts. And if we kill this spirit of academic freedom, then our decision making process is actually sick in actual fact. Wrong policies have lasting and damaging effect on running investors. And we need to appreciate that partisanship often lead to wrong decision making. Biases overweigh reason and judgment. Anytime partisanship takes place, then biases overweigh reasons and judgment. Partisanship encourages favoritism, partiality, and nepotism, solving the problem for a, a, a few group of people because they belong perhaps to my political party, they, be, they belong perhaps to my tribe, we come from the same hometown, or one reason, we are from the same church, so many different reasons can create no partiality, you know, and that is not too good for an academic setup. Partisanship sometimes lead to financial malfeasances because... When people who surround you keep telling you what you are doing is good, you can keep doing the wrong and they keep encouraging you because they are not using judgment to tell you whether what you are doing is right or not. They are using partisanship. So even though people give you support, you must question the type of support they are giving you. It can, mis it can be misleading rather. <laughs> so this is it. So all these attributes are contrary to good leadership and we need to appreciate them in the way we do things. And that's why I'm very glad we have a number of things senior academics who are actually gathered here. Right now, we are almost 50 people, and I'm very glad you are here to listen to this so that we can have a, a nice debate. Please jot down your question. I know there are a lot of questions coming up already, and uh, in the question time, we'll discuss them. What must we do? Need to be loyal. If you are not loyal, it, it is not good. Loyalty is needed. But be truthful. Be truthful. Loyalty doesn't mean partisanship. No. Loyalty is supporting the person, but tell the person or tell whoever when I'm going wrong, 
do the writing, do this, do that. Tell me the writing based on judgment and reason. That is more helpful. It, it is more helpful even to nations, to president, than anything else. Avoid slandering and seeking unmerited opportunities. Be skeptical, judgmental, assertive in all you do. Be bold to speak your dissenting mind in all situations, but avoid confrontation. Confrontation is not the language of the academics. Confrontation is usually the language of the union. And that is why they are union. Their voice is a bit higher. But, but when it comes to speaking your dissenting mind, what we see today is that we find a lot of academics who perhaps have dissenting mind on matters, but they keep it to themselves. They are quiet. This is a very, very, very a baby spirit in academic freedom. When you keep the truth to yourself, you don't tell anybody. How will people benefit, you know, the interest in that truth? So let the positive be constructive, but let's make our submission. We need to speak out our mind to help the university in all manners. Keeping quiet, <laughs> uh, you, you need to keep quiet when you don't know. That is also something we need to do because speaking for speaking is not good. Speak when you have the truth. Improve upon your decision-making approach by adopting a systematic approach of making judgment. And I will talk about a systematic approach of making judgment today, I propose one. You need to develop gradually the academic spirit. And it pleases me to talk about the Cartesian doubts. The Cartesian doubt is a systematic process of being highly skeptical about everything, doubting. Ah, if I'm a child, does it mean I'm coming from a father and a mother? Then where is my father coming from? Then you keep doubting and going back, going back to get to the very root of things. That approach help establish facts. They help establish truth. And they guide in decision-making better. Let's adopt the Cartesian doubt in how we approach our judgment. This also closes the brief chapter on partisanship and its impact on academic environment. And the third part of this presentation will talk briefly about the art of making judgment. And then we'll open the floor for questions. Judgment. What is judgment? It's the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. Sensible conclusion. Other definitions say that judgment is needed, especially when confronted with ethical decision making. Ethical decision making. Often complex situations with no clear cut resolution. You can't tell from the beginning that this is the best resolution or not. And without a right or wrong answer, it's in the end, it's the output that tells whether the decision you took was best. Judgment is needed, especially when confronted with this ethical decision making. And in the book authored by Davis in Ethics and the University, published in New York by Woodledge, on page 166 to 167, there was a proposal of a seven step guide for ethical decision making. And I take you through this. If you don't have one, adopt this for now. When, anytime you are making a decision, look at these seven steps, you know, guide to help yourself. Number one, state the problem. What is the problem that we are solving? State the problem clearly. Then check the facts. Please don't rely only on yeses. Make a way to find the fact by using the approach by the Cartesian doubts. Find the fact very clearly by yourself. Identify relevant factors that influence the decision making those that are internal and those that are external. And then develop a list of possible options. If you take this decision, if you take that decision, what are the list of possible options? Then in step five, conduct a number of tests. Because you have now a set of decisions you want to try, maybe four of them. If I take the, the first decision, what is harm test? How much harm would this, this decision I'm taking cause to the populace? Would that affect a lot of people? If that decision publicity test, if that decision should get into the news, can we stand out that this is the decision we took in a situation like this? Defensibility. Can we defend ourselves when this decision goes out that the University of Ghana has come out with a decision to ban the public transport on campus? Yet that decision fell in the, fell in the, in, in, in the public that decision again was criticized on radio and they were able to defend it. So you consider all this before you come out with a decision. Reversibility test. 
Can this decision reverse back and bite me, me the decision maker? You need to test that. And then that this decision comply with professional ethics. I belong to a profession. So things are sanctioned by law. So can I just do something that is contrary to the law? With this test, you should be able to make a choice on the best decision. But sometimes we jump quickly. A problem comes, we have not established the fact. We don't know the factors. And then we have taken a side already because we think that side benefits one person or maybe the other or a system. That approach is called the partisanship approach. Any two destructive. The right approach is to establish always the fact, go through this process, and then in six, make a choice based on step one to five. And even go back to review the, the few steps you have gone through to ensure that the decision you are making is actually a bold decision that you can stand, that can stand the test of time. So another ethical decision-making model tells that, yes, there are different concepts. I want to marry to the world. context and the fact, the stakeholders, the decision makers, the alternative decision you can make, how to evaluate the impact and negotiate, and then also find the best and optimal solution. We are left with two more slides to go. The impact on university, everything rises and falls on leadership. And now I want to complete this quote for you. I didn't complete it in the beginning, but knowing how to lead is only half the battle because understanding leadership and actually leading are two different activities. Similarly, understanding academic freedom and actually practicing it are two different things. A lot of people believe they have the academic mind, they understand, but then they go by their quiet. Things happen, they don't intervene. The, you are called to speak that mind. That spirit is a spirit that must grow into you. The practice is a skill that grows with time while serving in an academic environment for those who are committed to it. Seniority in academic field should ideally be followed by a proportional growth of the spirit of academic freedom till maturity. And that is why in the university setup, you have lecturers, senior lecturers, associate professors, full professors. This is, this is a way of telling how the, the mindset, the mindset is built to make decisions in a very constructive manner. You see, now it's very unfortunate to have a setup that maybe people, we ha we, we, they have title, they have names, but you realize at their first reaction on problem that the spirit is as low as that of a baby who is just starting academic, you know, environment. That, that, that actually is not good. That actually is not good. And this is happening all over in Africa. So please be very careful. I'm never talking about any particular investor. I'm talking of the concept that is happening generally in Africa. The opposite is rather predominant among senior academies in Africa. In Ghana, Benin, and so many different countries, South Africa, go to Gabon, and the same thing prevails almost all over. We have people with ranks, but not the spirit developed. Unfortunately, many may have age and academic titles, but their level of academic freedom might still not be mature. That is really unfortunate. And that is why this presentation is to signal to awakeness so that we are ready for that. Again, this I know. Can we can we silence? Um, can we check this? So we the, the this same thing. They are known by the expression. People are known by the expression in silence while in leadership position. So please, once you are called to be a leader, you must speak your academic freedom. You must help by exercising it, not to destroy people, to construct, to build a solid systems. These are a few literatures I want to share with you so that when you have time, you can read. Look, just look at this. The freedom of academic freedom, a legal dilemma, because modern man in his search for truth has turned away from kings, priests, commissars, and bureaucrats, and is left for better or worse with professors. People believe that all these people, <laughs> when a king make a decree, you don't have a choice whether it's right or wrong. But... In an academic sector, you definitely have people who are making judgment to tell you those. So people have to resort to professors. Look at this. Please have time to read this. This is a paper that is from Ghana, and the, the writer is probably from the University of Education. Academic freedom is relevance and challenges for public investing in Ghana today. 
my presentation is not even not an university in Ghana per se, but in Africa in general. But this paper particularly addresses something in Ghana. And then you can have a look at this paper if you have time. Just let me take a few sentences from the abstract. There have been various shapes of opinion shared on the concept of academic freedom. And I did say the definitions are many. These concepts mean different things to many and different people. Those outside the university view academic freedom with some level of suspicion. Even among the academia, academic freedom is rarely understood. To foster the growth of knowledge and its dissemination, the frontiers of academic freedom must be widened and embraced. And I like this sentence. To foster the growth of knowledge and its dissemination, the frontiers of academic freedom must be widened and embraced. And this paper seeks to make to explore the frontiers of academic freedom, and I encourage you to have a look at it. Look at this other paper published in Springer. Academic freedom as a source of rights, violation, a European perspective. I picked only this first sentence, which interests me, and I think with this tip, you should be able to, to be interested in this paper. The application of academic freedom may lead to a violation of individual rights, such as the right to respect private life or institutional rights, so it has legal implication in some other circumstances because they try to set up, you know, um, element in the law to, to, to deal with matters of academic freedom. Sometimes academic freedom expressed beyond its limit can now actually affect the right, uh, other rights of people, like the right to respect private life or institutional right, and therefore must be dealt with with um, uh, element of the law. And this paper actually uh, look at the case study in that regard. Look at this final one. This is the fourth one. I will limit myself here. Academic freedom is under threat around the world. Here is now, here's how we to defend it. Academic freedom is at the heart of successful universities. Did you see that? This statement is not coming from me. It's coming from the published article. Academic freedom is at the heart of successful university. UNESCO defined it as the right to freedom of teaching and discussion. Freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing results. Academics have pointed out that it's also, it's also, it also means self-governance and security of academic job to ensure independence. Please, we can discuss all this in the discussion session. Permit me to conclude this presentation by saying that private academics are baby academics irrespective of their age and titles. While partisanship retrogresses university progress and creates ungovernable conditions. Academic freedom, on the other hand, brings about prestige, respect, safe, and confident working environment, innovation, quick progress, and development, especially when top management is involved. Academic freedom should not be misunderstood to syndicalism, unionism, rioting, and the like. Academic freedom and good decision making are commensurately encouraged in academic institutions. On this note, I thank you very much. And this ends my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm done. Um, please, the moderator, over to you. <laughs> I hope I'm not taking a lot of time. You are within. Thank you very much, Professor. You are within the time. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful for this insightful presentation. And I believe that as academics, we'll pick lessons from this insightful presentation and then move on to use some of the important or go further to read. Um, try to be inquisitorial in order to be able to pick up a lot of the things that our able Pro Vice Chancellor has shared with us today, so that in earnest, we can be able to practice the good ones that will help us grow our university. And going forward, try to look at the issues that underpin our progress and get to understand why we should do what we are doing and why we should not do certain things so that we can be able to pick up the, the pieces for the development of our university. Now I'm going to invite questions from participants 
And then one by one, as they put together, I would like to advise Professor to take time and put down the questions that members are going to ask. Then following you give or you do justice to it. So first of all, I would like to see um, um, who is going to ask the first question. I want to see, raise your hand if you have any question, then I will invite you to, to ask the question. If you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself and then ask the question, then um, I'll, I'll, okay. Dr. Moussa Osmane Dumbia, hand is up. Can you please um, ask your question? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, your, your system keep on unmuting you. Um, the host, can you please unmute him, please? If you are driving, can you please park somewhere? And then, okay. yeah, please park somewhere and ask your question. Then we follow through, please. Okay. I think he's still muted. Meanwhile, yeah. he's... Yeah, I have seen that he's still muted. He has to be on mute. Host, can you please unmute him? Um, he keeps muting himself. All right, okay. Yeah. Um, Dr. Dumbia, can you unmute yourself and then speak, please? All you are speaking, we can hear because you have muted yourself. <laughs> Maybe you should move to another person. Let Mrs. Me... Jedu, yeah, your question, please, because Dumbia has muted himself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is not Mrs. Jedu. In fact, she used my laptop. That's what we have. <laughs> ah, but the laptop comes by Mrs. Jedu. So definitely, I will mention Mrs. Jedu. That's the name I see. Yeah, that is true. Thank you, Mabrita. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Prof, for the insightful uh, discussion you have given this morning. Um, you were really dwelling on decision making in really leadership. Especially on decision making, how leaders actually make decisions. And you were emphasizing that leaders are supposed to make the best decision. In fact, you also came out with about seven steps of how to arrive at a very good decision by quoting a particular person. In fact, in modern literature, making a best decision is very difficult to come by. Even the rational theorists believe that before you can make a very good decision or best decision, you would have gathered all the facts. But we are working under time constraints. And therefore, it's very difficult to gather every fact, evaluate the facts before you come out with a best decision. So how, what is the best option for leaders in making certain decisions within a particular time stream? when they are not able to gather all the facts. Because according to Chester Bennett, talking about the theory of modern truth, it says that since we cannot achieve rational decision-making, what we need to do is that we need to make decisions that are satisfying. So to what extent can leaders actually make their best decision within the shortest possible time they have? Thank you, Mr. Jedu. Prof, there's another question from uh, Papa Kwamela, Fen. He said, at what point do we say academics have limits because to every right, there's a limit? This is the question from Papa Kwamela, Fen, for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dumbia, you were unable to unmute yourself and we're waiting for your question. If you are back, can you please ask your question or uh, you test it on the chat and I'll pick it up for Prof to respond to it.
We are waiting Hello. for you, Dr. Dumbia, yes. Dr. Zub, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Please. Uh -huh. My question is, um, in the Supreme Court ruling of 2012, yeah, the Justice explained that freedom um, has a limit and that we can have too much liberality. My question is, academic freedom when does it end? Thank you. Prof, I think we'll take these three questions from you and then going forward, others that are going to ask questions, then I'll pick it up from there. Can you please answer us, please? Okay, thank you so much. Thank for the questions. Um, let me begin by the first one. The question from Mr. Jeju. Thank you so much for also realizing that uh, it's difficult to make rational decisions in leadership because um, you are constrained mainly by time. You are constrained by time and other challenges that you must make a quick decision sometimes. It's not always um, that you have a complete setup where you have everything by your hand and then you make a rational decision, but sometimes you don't have all the facts because you are constrained with time. I do agree with this. And that's why I'm saying that in ethical decision making, there is no right or wrong decision, but the outcome, the effect of the decision later tells whether the decision was good or not. Again, there is no absolute answer to your question, but the answer is this. Develop, let you have the establishment of a true decision making approach in you. That alone enables you to do the best out of the minimal information you have. See, is it the thing is what, what institution is in you when it comes to decision making? Is it is it is it the partisanship in bracket, or is it that you have the establishment but yet you lack all the information at a go? If the establishment is there, you can take the best decision with the little information you have. In the future, it might not tend to be the best, but I tell you, it might not be destructive because you have done the harm test to make sure that it's not too harmful to people. You might have done the publicity test. You might have done the reversibility test and a number of tests. So if the establishment is in you, even in the, in the midst of constraint and minimal information, and even time, you should be able to make a decision that will not call overall best decision in all cases, but that will be very meaningful in the future. However, when the establishment is not in you and you are faced with this constraint, you can really take a very, very, very wrong decision. That can affect a lot of people. So the bottom line is that let's encourage the establishment of that academic freedom and judgment procedure in people so that that can actually help in decision making. The second point I would like to make about the, 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 the next two questions are, are very similar in nature. What is the limit of the academic freedom? I believe, and I, and I think one of the publications I show you was looking at a law case. It's another dimension I wanted to develop for this presentation, but I decided not to go into it much because I'm not a, a legal person, <laughs> a legal brain. But the little I've read shows clearly that there are limits to freedoms. There are. And academic freedom too has got limits. And the limit of academic freedom actually come into play when it starts interfering with other rights the right of private life, the right of institutional, the institutional right. There are some information you cannot disclose about an information, an institution. There are some privacy for an institution. There are some commitment you cannot take when you are not in leadership position. Only a leader of an institution can commit the institution into money making and other businesses. You can do that. But if your exercising of academic freedom will not conflict with some of those institutional rights, or even people's right, then that becomes actually a, a very challenging matter. So there is the, the literature is saying that there's no clear cut to say that this is where the boundaries of academic freedom are limited. But it says clearly that when you conflict with other law, it becomes actually subject to 
um, constitutional matter. It has to go to court sometime for people to go into it. And, and a lot of lawsuits actually have been tabled before court in Europe because of academic freedom and their exercise. So briefly, we need to just read more and be see concept about how we exercise this freedom, not to affect other laws, and then I think we can stay within these boundaries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mavi. Mm -hmm. I have a question here for you. And my question is, as academics, the ways of doing things that lead to a whole lot of the Pandora that there is this mistrust between management and academic because of certain actions that management have taken vis-a-vis -vis the issue about management is trying to cow down the academics and academics are not ready to be cowed down. Management is trying to limit their freedom and so forth and so forth because of certain styles of leadership. So as we are, I know our, our freedom is largely our ability to research and publish it as it is without concealing any truth out of our publications. Perfect. And if that is going to hurt anybody, are we limited? <laughs> yes. Um... I, I, thank you so much. I think your concern is well noted. I, I mean, uh, leadership, I, I said it in the beginning, that it's not for anything that there is attempt to develop robots to now lead people. It is because leadership hopefully has failed, not only in, in Ghana, not only in Africa, but even in Europe and America. Human, human beings have failed in exercising proper leadership. And this is mainly due to interest and other things that we cannot explain completely here. More than 90% of failure from leadership, uh, of leadership has been in failure mode. So it is quite um, appalling. And it is because of some of these things we, we are saying. When um, we open up for academic freedom to be exercised in the place, it does not actually destroy management, but it constructs management. It builds management. It helps in decision-making that are very strong and sustainable. Um, it should just be encouraged. And that is why we are making this presentation to raise awareness. This should just be encouraged. It, it, it brings also diplomacy, but you can't tell. In some circumstances, leaders uh, accept a bit of diplomacy, but others is a bit autocratic because of their background and other things. But in all in all, this presentation is to actually bring us to the right spirit so that we know that this is how things go right. When we allow people to exercise that freedom, they bring to us innovation, they bring to us new knowledge, they bring to us new side of the issue we haven't seen. That helps in a better decision making. And together we can construct you know, a better university, a better settlement and all this. So I will just say that there is no clear-cut limit to what you can put in. You who is putting the truth to, uh, be careful not to also go in and put truth that uh, go beyond the academic freedom. You see, for instance, you can do a research and publish maybe uh, maybe that uh, the vaccine of COVID-19 perhaps, uh, perhaps is not effective or is effective. If you publish that it's effective and you are supporting the people, maybe your academic truth by doing the experiment prove that it's not effective. But when you come public and you say it's not effective, who will go after you? The World Health Organization will go after you. They will chase you from all corners. You know, even if it happened to be truly uh, uh, the fact that it's not effective in your circumstances. So you have to be careful a bit because it, it becomes difficult to establish the boundaries. But it's not, you must know, you must know where your limit, your, your limit are. <laughs> I don't know what to say more. <laughs> Otherwise, you should prepare for another fight because there is a whole law and a lot of issues behind some of the decisions. So you can speak your truth in a certain manner or get to the right forum to speak some of the truth. But uh, you should know that not all truth can get into the public anyhow. This can cause damaging effects and even take you into 
and more legal issues. That, that's all I can say for now. But people are afraid to also speak and share their mind on this. <laughs> okay, Prof. Um, another question. The question is, could publicity test be the same as advanced organizer? Or advanced organizer is where something is thrown out there to get, to get the public reaction. Could the publicity test be the same as advanced organizer? That's a question from um, about Kwame uh, Nafin. Uh, would the publicity test mean the same as uh, advanced? No, no. The advanced organizer is, is, is like you are testing the waters. Mm -hmm. Testing the waters to see what, what will happen. And that is different from the publicity test, right? They are similar to some extent because the publicity test doesn't really go into trying it. But it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a tool for assessment that the leader has. So okay. it's a thinking. He, he, he is not really exercising it. But he's here saying that if I take the decision to say that from today, uh, Accra Technical University school fees will be 10000 for each student, what would the public, well, how would the public behave? That what thing is what we are calling the, the test. Yeah. But the, the, the other one is to go out really and say it and see what will happen. So those are where the differences are. Okay. The mm -hmm. Yeah, the question, there's a question from Mr. Jedu on okay. the screen, Mrs. Jedu. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much. Um, thank you Maybe very some much. contributions. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, the advanced organizer in policy analysis, there's something we call floating. Any time you do to make... We view any time people want to make certain decisions or bring about certain policies, they try to tease or test the waters. In case we decide to do this, what will be the reaction of the people? Most yes. politicians do that. And when they do that, you know, people are talking about it, then they withdraw as if they were just playing. But mm -hmm. if they realize that people have really bought into it, then they move there and then they bring out the policy. So it's a way of floating an idea that managers always have. Thank now, so the other contribution I want to make is that in university settings, because sometimes you have so much mistrust, we can't trust. It's like the, the trust is not there so much. <laughs> and that is why it's very important in, in, in policy making. There's something called program decisions. The decisions are programmed. Let's say we have deadline for this. All these things are written down. So once it happens, you just go into the decision and you bring it. If the decision becomes haphazard, then people can sit down and take decisions at any time. But our decisions must be programmed. At this time, four years, you can go for promotions, written to you. You are doing retirement, written to you. You are doing everybody knows whatever is happening. So that people will not have to sit down and say, it has come, let's go and take another decision. So let's try and make more of program decisions, bringing people together to make certain policy guidelines to determine how certain things should happen. Now, the question I have is this. Bro, you give three definitions of academic freedom. One where a university has to determine whatever they want to do with respect to academics. Another one has to do with the individual professor coming out his own curriculum and the last one by Einstein, where the search for truth becomes the order of the day. Now, if we are always resting on professors, academics, to give us the truth, you know, even academics differ on various concepts. So to what extent can we really give the thing to academics and say that, oh, once we give it to them, they will give it their best. When they themselves, within them themselves, differ on a number of issues, <laughs> thank you so much Mr. Jedu <laughs> thank you so much I, I, I'm excited by listening to you <laughs> let me say that uh, the issue of program decision you mentioned is a, is a normal concept academic institutions run on systematic approach approaches so many things have been programmed already for instance people knows that there are a lot of policies that document a lot of things in academic institutions. There is an academic calendar that tells the number of activities. Those are not decisions to be made again. They have been made already in an academic calendar. People's promotion, these again have been made already available. Policies are there. People know at this time I can apply. Now, this challenge we are talking about is mostly not on the program decisions, but it deals mostly with the ethical type of decision or in quote, Decisions that comes on the table 
almost every day, but yet are not documented directly in any policy and otherwise. And I can tell you, this, this type of decision, they come more often and they are more destructive than even the program one. They are delicate in nature, very delicate. I don't want to give particular examples, but for instance, look at, I give this example. You are, you are in university, you are here. Perhaps let's assume you have a budget um, uh, of 20 million and suddenly they, 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 you come across a building being advertised that will be sold maybe at 8 million and you see that maybe if you purchase that, you can make economic profit out of it and expand your, your boundaries and have a bigger campus and do more activities. Such decision, for instance, is not in any documented or program something. But you must decide now. And what are you going to use to decide? Are you going, you must state, uh, you, you must play on the internal, external factors. Whether when you do it, will it be profitable to you? You must do a lot of analysis here and there. This is what we're talking about. And, and sometimes when, when making sad decisions is not based on this approach, you can just decide because perhaps the one who is selling the building is coming from my hometown. This is what we want to avoid. Or the one who is selling the building is from my church or something like that. You get it. You need to have the systematic approach to deal with this type of decision making. Now, coming to the fact that Einstein referred to <laughs> the fact that uh, issues are, are based on truth and then academic um, professors, the term professors here, I want to believe, I want to let you believe in me that it's not just professor, academic professor in nature, even you, the senior administrative uh, officers in the rank of assistant registrars and above are part of this. But what are they trying to say? Research is based on experimental approach. If the research approach is growing to you, you know that, for instance, if I'm researching in what the mixture of these two substances will give tomorrow, it is not good for a researcher to give a side or a view before going through the experiment. He wants to try them severally, he go through the experimental method a number of times until he gets clear results, and based on the result, he can tell whether it goes this way or the other way. That becomes systematic instead of decision based on sentiment and emotion. And this is the reason why matters that are critical, that you cannot, you cannot just use your emotion and sentiment to decide. You refer them to this process. You refer them to the academia so that they can use an established and systematic process to check the foundation of these truths. And based on that, they can come out and tell you boldly whether it is right or it is wrong. This is why they believe to the, the, the professors. So it does not matter whether they have divergent fields, but provided they have the same process in them to make decisions, they should be able to actually establish that. And what we are crying for is that, it's like we are getting the title and we, we a lot of us, and then um, not, I'm not talking of uh, our history, I'm talking of generally in Africa, but the criticality in doing the work is also not there. And therefore, we need to bring it to life. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Amevi Akapovi. Um, Jodu, your hand is up again. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other question, colleagues and participants? Um, without much I do, uh, yes, another question is, is it only research that leads to the arrival of food? If you does not engage in research, how can someone have the truth to put out? That is the question that is coming from uh, Papa Kwame Nafin. Thank you, mm -hmm. Prof. Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, um, when you go to our villages, we have kings, or in our constituency, we have um, established, you know, leadership that do not necessarily go to school or learn about research, yet they have been able to solve a lot of problems and make decisions that have been quite good for the populations. Sometimes it's, it's rather instinctive to have the established process uh, in you of making judgment. The point, the bottom line here is making judgment. There's not research necessarily. Research is that a systematic approach of doing the same. But the process of making judgment, in all cases, 
whether from somebody who is who knows research as we know or for somebody who doesn't know it it's always based on a few facts that are related in my seven step approach the person must know the fact you can't make a good judgment on a problem without knowing the fact you cannot make a good judgment without test without knowing the factors that come into play internally and externally is it a land issue somebody has encroached another person and then you don't know how the encroachment happened you want to solve it you need to know fact you need to know the factors that come into play internal and ex external you need to to explore possible solutions that can bring people to peace and then sometimes intuitively come with the best one that causes less harm less problem to everybody is the system is that approach that rather you need but when you have research in addition that is you have gone through university it makes the systematic approach even stronger in you this is the answer i can give to to this question for now thank you prof and then we are most grateful if there's no any other question as i cannot see um any hand up and any question in the chat um, uh, the answer uh, is uh, asking. The answer is asking another one. He said, um, "Do I have the academic right to disprove some one's work he or she has done?" Do I have the academic right to disclose? To disprove? To disprove? Yes. Yeah. Someone's yes. work. Yes. That he or she has done. Yes, you have. You can do that. You have, you have that. If if you if the, it's, it's happening all the time, provided you are not doing it from um, any um, evil perspective, malicious, it, malicious, uh, malicious perspective. I may yeah. say, you see, if the truth is not well established and you found it otherwise, you you you, you are you are you are good to go and publish your truth and then support it with your reasons and facts. But any time it's malicious, I tell you, there will be a loophole in your own process that the person will also take on later and take you on. And it becomes a game that is not too helpful. So let's be careful. It's all about the ethics in what we are doing. Thank you, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think uh, Chiflos. Chiflos has a question. Can you ask Chiflos, please? Okay. Um, Prof, we, we thank you for this presentation. It's, it's, a, it's an eye-opener. But mine is a little bit controversial, and I think you will bear with me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> your, uh, go, ahead, your, go ahead. Your assertion that um, you have disproved that the vaccine is not working. Instead of coming out, you decide to not to do it. But the rest, that, that is academic dishonesty. I believe that if your methodology is solid, and the rest, academic uh, academic freedom dictates that you state it even if it brings the heavens down. And in the end, the, somebody else, if somebody else has something to say about it, then he comes out to say it. Because once you say that you are trying to um, manage the truth in a way, then you are stifling academic freedom. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that is quite a, a, a point that I would like to make so, and suggest. Pagofi, pa, pa, pa there is history here. Um, I remember Professor William Sharp of Harvard University when he came out with the beta, which is a risk of a company's equity, blah, 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 and what have you. At the time he did it, he became one of the Nobel Prize winning awards in portfolio theory. Then somewhere along the line, I had two students, Eugene Farmer and French, who he taught during and survived their PhD thesis. These guys, reviewing their own professors and papers, um, have different opinions. But at the time they were students, they never, I will tell you, they never challenged their professor until they were graduated as PhD students. And the first thing in their publication was to challenge the basis of the beta as propounded by their professor. Uh, so that, at that the is... time, at the time they were not able to challenge him. We will say they were concealing the truth. 
I, 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 I don't know the circumstances that brought them to that conclusion, but what happened was that eventually they challenged him. No, they and challenge. Eventually, they challenge. That's why I'm very good. Very good. So depending you should, upon you your should not, you should not, you should not do anything to prevent the truth from being. No, 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 no. You, you will have uh -huh. to. And whatever be the case, whatever, we should, we should whatever the truth is, must be said. It must be said. In, it must be said. In, in, can I, can in, I say something about that? Yes, yeah, coming. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Theophilus. Thank you so much. I think it's clear. The the truth is all we are talking about. But sure. I, I would like you to also know that you, it's a decision-making matter, rather. Apart from your truth, there is also a decision to disclose it as it is or not. And as you say, academic um, freedom promotes that honesty, that you come with the truth clearly. But sometimes in the decision-making model that I exposed to you, I presented to you, there is this test of harm, test of publicity, and test of reversibility. Now, the test of harm is to look at the harm it can cause. The test of publicity is how, when you get into the mass media, what harm can this cause again? And more importantly, the test of reversibility. What can this, what can happen to me, me, myself? What I've seen is true. Then I blindly say I'm exercising my academic uh, freedom and I put it out and it can lead me to death. You see, you, you need to be a bit cautious. Because that is where the, 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 the boundary of academic freedom is now coming. There are limits to everything. If you are not careful, just go back to the history and you see a lot of people who were silently killed for some of the truth they believe and brought. And some yeah. were rejected, even yeah. they have to die long before. So perhaps if you want some to. Some were die, crucified. I remember during our philosophy class. It's a chance. So, yeah. you, you may come out with something like this, but you must some be were, aware of what actually. can happen to you next. Yeah. And if you can stand it, so be it. Your name may be eternal, but you, you can go. So we, we can't tell. We bro, can't tell. Bro, bro, bro. <laughs> Galileo, um, the, the, Galileo the, the, and the rest the, 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 were all, were all prosecuted for their, for their views. <laughs> a contribution here by Lawrence. Let's Lawrence, Lawrence um, Nguyenyo was saying that you also have the academic duty to disprove your own work when you later find out Alternative results in your subsequent works is different from what you do. And I can refer this one to Mila Modigliani in 1958 when they first published about MM theory. And they realized that in the world of taxation where we can tax things, and in their, one of their propositions say that um, in absence of tax, and there cannot be taxation or there cannot be a world without a taxation. And therefore, they went back. In 1967, that is nine years later, to rewrite back whatever they put up there as um, as their earlier proposition for the theory they propounded in their seminar work in 1958. So, like Lawrence is saying, you have academic duty to disprove your own work when you later find that there is an alternative to the results you have subsequently worked on. Now, um, my, my, please, my, I think there's a final question thing. from the, the my friend. Uh, I did not finish you, please. Ah, uh, you didn't finish. Oh, okay. That's yeah. right. Um, I would like to ask, where do you draw the line? Because Prof was talking about nepotism, chronism, and the rest. You see, nepotism. sometimes, um, due to familiarity, somebody may be able to do something for you because you have worked with him over the years over, yeah. and may have that kind of advantage and qualification to hold a particular position. So if we are going to say that you give position based on purely uh, let me say purely qualification uh, matters and without considering other personal or other issues, won't that be a problem, or that is also fine when you do it that way? Um, I, I, uh, thank you. I think you, you, the, your question is very clear. Um, you can, any times you have established a good process, and uh, we are human beings. Human beings have preferences. Even though we are, we are discouraging things like nepotism and uh, the rest, 
you are human being and you have a preference. So when you face, if you are faced with a situation, the thing is when you establish a process, respect it. If the process makes two people qualified at the same level, then come your preference. But if the process disqualifies the person you prefer and you want to use him above the one who is qualified, then that is challenge. That becomes an obvious bias. And that is where the definition of the partisanship comes in. It says that support a person or group um, um, or, 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 or a cause, especially when seen as biased or emotional, that, that is destructive. The bias, that is so obvious because somebody is not supposed to be, like you are talking of position, for instance, maybe to get the position of an accountant in the university, I, I don't want to mention a case, but you, you need to have maybe a certificate in accounting, okay? And then you have somebody you like who perhaps help you at home in good accounting, but does not have a certificate. Then, you, even though people have applied, you go and pick that person and say he's the best. That causes a lot, that's clear bias. And this one, it, it, that, it discourages a lot of things. So as far as you love the person, you have to encourage the person to qualify. He must qualify first before preference comes in. So not to say that we disqualify preference, but to give more values to the system first, and then preferences can come later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And I um, understand, Jadu. Oh, no, there's a question from Dr. Um, at Aidu, the head of the uh, Building Technology Department. He is asking about, um, he wants to stress on the way forward on the contemporary research would ends up being on the shelves instead of being implemented. And he's asking, do you think academic freedom is being impeded? Uh, uh, where is he asking in our contest here? He's talking about contemporary, which contemporary said that end up on shelves instead of being implemented. Yes. So from yes, that yes. angle, do you think academic freedom is being impeded? Yes, to some extent, yes. Because you see, what is the relevance? And that's a big challenge nationwide and con continent-wide. What is the essence of having a lot of research that are not being put in practice? Let's ask ourselves that question. Why at all do we research when the findings of the research do not inform any decision making or do not bring any change in our societal life or everyday life? Ideally, professors, as we are in all our, uh, our field, we should have something that we carry as the innovation that have brought us to this level. There is something we must point that has changed fundamentally how it was done in life. And that is by putting the book out of the shelves and putting it in practice. But it, it has become like a straight jacket thing. You just do something, then you put it there, and then you get the name with it, and we continue. It has killed the spirit of real academic freedom. Because people's academic freedom are well expressed in the research they have conducted. And those actually should, should be guarded, you know, as a database in decision making. But this is not being done. And I would like to support this, that yes, if there is a way research findings can be put into real practice and put in use, it will only help academic freedom to be well expressed, well right. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's another question from Jadu. He said they want a contribution on the truth and all that. So, Mr. Jadu. I think you want to help us. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, in fact, I wanted to make a contribution on what uh, Mr. Chevros Ayanfo asked concerning when you have discovered something, you need to put it out there irrespective of what will ever happen to you. We have to really understand what is meant by truth. We have really not defined what is meant by truth. What is truth? Truth always has time. You know that there were a lot of things people thought they were truths. They discovered in the past. The church, which was believed in the 16th century, the 15th, century, the believer era, to have been the mouthpiece of truth, said that the world was certain on four walls. But Gamaliel came in later, so many years back, and said, no, it's not true. The world is spherical. And that one became the truth. And he was really killed for that. So at what point can you say you have discovered the truth and therefore you can die for the truth? And because whatever you discover is subject to verification. 
And there are a number of theories as students. We have even said that these theories were not true because but at the time, they were believed to be very true. So let us really be very careful when you are talking about truth and research, because truth is a concept that is very, very difficult to define, understand, and also clarify, because the human perception is not able to perceive the truth. But the truth is really very difficult. And therefore, don't say you have discovered the truth. You have discovered something. If somebody will come later in the Time. And then you die for nothing. So don't die for something that you can't really be. <laughs> this is really the fact. I think because we can continue this debate even after the presentation. <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> I'm not okay. In absence of any other further um, questions that we're talking about, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Lawrence um, Nubenyo to give closing remarks. Then, of course, um, we put it or we close from this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, express my appreciation to the speaker of today's event. Uh, Professor Amavi Akakovi, the moderator, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Zubero, for their valuable contribution to our webinar series. My deepest gratitude goes to all the participants and organizers who helped to make it such a successful event. Hearing from the speaker and all participants has educated me and all of us on some fundamentals of leadership within the constraints of various biases. It is important to uh, regularly hear the views from academic experts on relevant matters, uh, such as the principle and practice of making good judgments of issues, which is at the core of drawing accurate conclusions and making important policies for problem solving. I'm certain that the takeaways from this webinar will further deepen our thinking and stimulate our problem-solving skills as leaders in various aspects of our lives. I think that uh, today's event has been very effective in meeting its purpose as it touches on academic freedom, uh, which comes with the right to search for uh, truth in quote, as this discussion, of course, will continue with the last contribution talking about truth being uh, a topic on its own as a controversy, and, uh, it's relative to time and the duty to make our findings known. Uh, Prof also touched on the importance of artificial intelligence and robotics in eliminating the effects of human error, which may arise from upbringing, emotions, as well as some uh, inherent uh, personal characteristics. Of course, uh, Prof was, is talking as uh, an engineer in that aspect. It will be very interesting to see in the future uh, having some discussions uh, from someone who for, is from the background of uh, psychology uh, to see maybe the psychology and philosophy of uh, 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 say leadership or academic freedom, or uh, you know that aspect of even biochemistry, the chemistry behind our behavior, why we take certain decisions. It would be interesting to see the views of someone from uh, such a background talk about these issues uh, from that background. Okay, then um, of course uh, we also touched on the negative impact of uh, uh, partisanship. Uh, such as favoritism, partiality, nepotism, and the like. Uh, and in our context, how making unsystematic decisions can affect the development of our educational institutions and society as a whole. Uh, we, we also uh, heard from the speaker on uh, how to be loyal and truthful
We lost the signal. Or... The yeah, station. You, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you are here. So that the 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 decisions we make are not. Now, all these are important for our development uh, uh, of the of academic freedom, and and some are perhaps uh, more far-reaching than just academic freedom. These also raise the obvious question of what could or should be the role of academia in shaping the practice of uh, making good judgments on important issues. Of course, uh, there are a number of specific questions uh, raised during our discussions which may need further examination by us as academics, especially the last uh, contribution about the definition of truth itself. Uh, I think at this point, I will say uh, thank you all once again for participating in this webinar. We very much appreciate your presence and your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Over to you, the host, please. Moderator, you can invite somebody to give a final prayer. Okay. Um, Sir Flos, Enyamfo, can you give us a closing prayer, then we'll end up. Okay. Fa uh, Father, we thank you for a successful discussion we ask that as we continue to discuss these issues you open our minds and our hearts and everything that we do will be a success we thank you and we ask that anyone who is connected to the organization of such a program will be blessed in various ways this we pray in jesus name amen amen